Jeff Antoniak, welcome to Guided Listening this week. So for the first time, I don't know, we've done 100 Guided Listenings, probably more. I don't think we've ever done any Bud Powell, or at least Bud Powell as the leader and the composer. So we're going to finally do Bouncing with Bud. Very important bebop tune. A little off the beaten path. You know, so many stuff is horn player centric. We're not going to talk about why that is. Um, But, you know, it's Charlie Parker and it's... Monk, and you know, there's those real heavyweights of uh, the bebop era that we think about. But uh, today we're going to be listening to Sonny Rollins on the tenor saxophone, Fats Navarro on trumpet, Tommy Potter on bass. Uh, who is it? Uh, uh, Roy Haynes on drums, and uh, and of course, Bud Powell on piano. This is from 19, I want to say 48. This isn't the original recording. But it's the one that I you know, kind of happened upon, started listening to, and there's a lot of great stuff here, so we're going to listen to it. It's very short, um, so it's three minutes, three minutes and 30 seconds long. So, you know, there were some sort of restrictions to the recording process, you know, back in the earlier days and airplay and, you know, all of the various reasons. Uh, so, you know, but I would have loved to have heard these guys open this up and play this live for eight or 10 minutes or however long it would have been. But this is a nice, concise arrangement. We may even rewind, listen back to a couple things, listen to it a second time. We'll see what happens. Um, and this is a tune I'm excited about because I want to get into it deeper. So when I want to get into something deeper as a professional musician, I teach it. <laughs> so at the Jazzwire Summer Summit, the, the in-person one that we're doing, I'm here for the 21st year in the Washington, D.C. area. This is one of the 14 songs we've picked. So if you would like to join us, and this is an event that is for adult musicians. So I'm talking about people, average age has to be 60, 70. So we get people in their 40s, we get people in their 80s, but that's kind of our sweet spot. Now, We do have scholarships for young people. Every year we get funding from the Jazzwire people that care about this music and care about the next generation. We've got some money donated for six scholarships. This is for bass players and drummers. Three of those scholarships are for young women. So do you know a young woman, 16 through 21, so later high school, early college perhaps, and uh, they want a free ride to the Jazzwire Summer Summit. So please spread the word, have them reach out, go to the Jazzwire website and reach out to me and let's get this happening. We've got funding to get three young women and then three other folks, bass players, drummers, attending and working with our faculty. So now, as I was saying, we picked 14 songs. This is one of the 14 songs. Um, And we have folks attend at all ability levels. So folks who are very new to jazz, call them beginners, novices, all the way up to semi-pros, people who are earning money out there playing jazz. And we've got Sonny Rollins tunes, we've got Herbie Hancock tunes, we've got Freddie Hubbard, Cedar Walton, Joe Henderson, Toots Thielmans. We've got um, 14 uh, really important jazz tunes that you could be working on with us. So I hope you will join us. Okay, so let's jump into Bouncing with Bud. So even though it's a short, concise tune, it's a it's a 32-measure a, A, B, A form. It's not rhythm changes, but it has things in common with rhythm changes. So that's what we're talking about in the lessons we're doing on this Inside Jazzwire this week, is how this has things in common, but it's definitely not rhythm changes. So it's kind of interesting. Has an intro that we only hear at the beginning of the tune, and then it has this interlude after the melody uh, that we hear Um, right before the solo start. And there's ways that we could reuse that information. So let's listen to this. So this is 1948. So I mean, this is is like right smack in the middle of the bebop era. Charlie Parker didn't pass away until 1955. So I mean, Bird is around and alive. And, um, and, you know, this music is what's happening. So let's check it out. Bouncing with Bud. Here's our intro. Kind of a cool fanfare kind of sound, especially with the trumpet. And here's our melody. We're hearing trumpet and tenor sax in unison. Listen to the little fills.
kind of built right into the melody, right? Nice, so at the bridge, horns lay out, Bud Powell has the bridge. So great orchestration, simple but awesome. Last day section. And now we have that little fill. Let's stop there. So, um, ba -doo -da, ba -doo -da, right? So the horns play something and Bud plays it back. So wonderful call and response built into the song. Now, Bud wrote the song, so he knew what was coming up. He knows this tune pretty well, right? But the amazing thing is, listen to Roy Haynes, that he is catching that along with Bud Powell. So a great drummer, and, and, and that's kind of what bebop was all about. It was bringing the drums to the fore, uh, historically more. It wasn't, you know, the, the drums used to be sort of just that sound in the back. It was a pulse. It was dance music. It helped us able to dance to it. But um, as far as the drums sort of being involved in a melodic kind of way, not so much. And so the bebop drummers and Max Roach, holy cow, um, really made that happen. So let's go back to the beginning. And now that you've heard a little bit about this, you know, how this great bebop melody goes, I want you to be listening for the piano and the drums specifically. Now the bass part, Tommy Potter in this instance, um, it is walking bass all the way through. In the intro, it's sort of this weird in-between kind of thing. It's not quite connected. Um, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. So I'm, I'm not sure if it didn't quite gel, if he was playing exactly what Bud Powell wanted on the bass, but there's some weird syncopations that aren't quite lining up and, and uh, I'd want to listen to some other versions and hear how the other bass players treat it. So let's check it out and listen to specifically piano and drums and how they're interacting with the melody. Do you hear what Max Roach, how he's playing with Bud Powell just in the intro? Really cool. But uh, that, that little bit. And the whole way, by the way, uh, Roy Haynes on the hi-hat at this point. That great fill he does coming out of the bridge. Awesome. You hear that? Amazing. Interlude. Big, huge sound. So we're only halfway through a chorus. There was only 16 measures and now trumpet. So they've split up one chorus to help make this really short. That's Navarro. Man, what a killer player. So that's just one chorus. And now Bud is soloing. So the two horn players split a chorus. Really short solos. And did you hear how the rhythm section kind of came down behind the piano? Well, Roy Haynes went from cymbal behind the trumpet back to the hi-hat for piano. So it kind of contains the sound. All right, so Bud's taking a whole chorus. It's his album. The Amazing Bud Powell is the name of the album. So yeah, he gets a whole chorus. And man, listening to how Roy Haynes is pushing the band and pushing the soloist along, but not getting in the way. We're gonna go back and listen to that. So here's our melody out, first A section. With those great fills and call and response. Oh, 
So, I mean, we're done there. Uh, two A sections, there was no bridge, there was no last A section, there was no interlude, none of that. That was three minutes and three seconds long. That is so short. That would be half of the first tenor solo in <laughs> any kind of modern playing, right? So uh, yeah, incredibly short, tight arrangement, but man, we could tell the band was so well rehearsed that Roy Haynes knew that tune like the back of his hand. The, you know, the melody was played really well and everything, but man, it, it was so great. So I want to listen back. I want to go back and listen to the two horn solos. And what I want you to think about is what came, you know, only a handful of years before this and was still happening was swing music, right? Not bebop. Bebop was a reaction. It was the young guys like in your face version of jazz, right? So the swing stuff was a little more romantic sounding maybe. It was sort of longer phrases and... Um, yeah, and, and it, it was more dance music and romantic sounding, the way we'd speak to somebody romantically. The bebop guys, it's a little more in your face. It's a harder sound on the instrument. The articulations were tighter and shorter. Bebop. Lots of snappy articulations. So in, it's interesting that in both Sonny Rollins' solo and Fats Navarro's solo on trumpet, we're hearing long phrase endings, ba da do da and then we'd hear ba da do da a short ending. The last note of a phrase can be held out long, which sounds more romantic, more chill, or it can be snapped off, right? And that, that has a real percussive feel to it. And we hear both. And, and I do that in my playing and, you know, most modern jazz music. Articulation is one of the things we use to express ourselves. So it's not like nobody played long romantic notes after 1948. Of course, that's not the case. But it's cool to listen. So for many of us, and I'm talking about players, this is one of the things we talk about at, at Inside Jazz Wire. This is something we'll be talking about at the Summer Summit is how we express ourselves has a lot to do with the notes we choose and the licks and the scales and all that improv stuff, the rhythms we choose, but the articulations are hugely important. That has to, that enunciation, and it says a lot about sort of style. So let's go back and listen to um, from the horn solos out. And when we get into the piano solo, listen to Bud Powell, enjoy Bud Powell, but listen to how Roy Haynes is kicking him behind the solo. What does that mean by kicking him? Um, good bebop drumming, and then that, of course, informed everything that came for the next 70 years. Listen to how Roy Haynes' snare drum is talking to his bass drum. The higher snare drum, tack a tick a tat, right? And the bass drum, boom. And that's what a drummer kind of does, is he's responding to what he's hearing from the piano solo, let's say, but those two instruments talk to each other. But did it boom, dink dink, did boom boom, and how they're talking to each other. It's the best way to put it. Check that out. Check that out, and check that out with on every album you own, on every music you listen to. That sort of bebop and later in the jazz style, um, specifically in the jazz style. And I was talking about how drums became more melodic, more quote unquote musical. Um, that's one of the things I'm talking about, is the drummer was playing melodies, a melody on the ride cymbal. It wasn't just a pattern. It wasn't just a beat. There was a melody going on there. There were melodies going on, and specifically between the snare and the bass drum. It's really fascinating. Let's check it out. Listen to the note in Duh. Long note. Boo dot short note. Do dot short. Good quiet here. Two longer note endings. And what a great flow. See, long note ending there. So 
that's um, so those are really short solos and we would hear them mixing and mashing but start getting used to what it feels like when somebody holds a note longer and when they snap it off it's a really different feel all right bud solo and of course we can do this on piano too right but those snapped off sounds are one of the things that makes bebop sound like bebop literally that word bebop, that onomatopoeia, is describing the articulation of bebop. I've heard Dizzy Gillespie tell that story in person, where the name bebop came from, came from articulation. Da, 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 boo, boo. What Roy just played there, right? That's the thing to start listening to. And when you start hearing a bebop soloist and then how a great bebop player, Max Roach, Roy, you know, any of those great players, how what they're doing behind to sort of kick things ahead, to kind of percolate and add energy, but also not to do it in a way that's overtaking the soloist. That informed every drummer for the next 70 or 75 years up till today. Every jazz drummer owes everything to these guys for expanding how the instrument works. It's fascinating stuff. So I would love to work with this song and 13 other songs by all those great people that I was mentioning at the Summer Summit with you. So we are sold out for horn spots. We are sold out for piano spots. We're sold out for guitar spots, but we have a waiting list. Every once in a while, somebody cancels. So do get in contact with us. Get put on the waiting list. We also have people come in for one or two days, auditors. So you could do that. We can still get you in. Um, we have bass. Uh, I think we have three or four bass and drum spots left. So, I mean, we're basically almost sold out, but we're holding some of those for our scholarship winners. So it's really important to me that you reach out to young men and young women you know bass players, drummers, who would be able to come in and have an ex incredible experience with us at the Jazzwire Summer Summit. It's July 24 through 27. So please think about who you know. Do you know a band director? Do you know a private teacher? Do you have a kid? Do you know a kid? Let's get them um, the opportunity to attend. So thank you for being here with Bud Powell and me today. We will see you again next week. Take care.